Welcome back. In this lecture, we will address the topic of Joule Thompson coefficient and derive certain relationship expressions that are relevant for real gases. Previously, in the last lecture, we had looked at these four new thermodynamic state functions that are relevant for different experimental conditions, depending upon what is kept a constant, certain thermodynamic potential function is being extremized. So that's the motivation for introducing these new thermodynamic functions besides entropy. So these are all exact differentials. Therefore, we can do something more, we can derive new relationship called Maxwell's relations because of the fact these four are exact differentials. So this and this can be related, this quantity and this quantity can be related and so on. And then we had a pattern for deriving certain other expressions. Okay, so why do we derive these expressions? Certain quantities which you want to be estimating can be estimated by using by using Maxwell's relationship and converting these expressions into more measurable forms. Okay, so that's the reason why we derive all these expressions. So the general logic will be that we will start with a exact differentiation. For example, in the case of classius clapeyron relationship, we started with dH. Okay, as so we looked at uh, a system that is undergoing phase transition, converting from a liquid to gas, and we started with dH okay, at uh, a particular experimental condition. Then we, uh, after starting with the exact definition, we use a Maxwell relationship. Uh, in fact, I think we use this Maxwell relationship. This is a hard to measure quantity. Uh, we replace this with this, uh, and then uh, with certain simple rearrangement, we were able to get this form. This is an important uh, relationship that gives you the change in saturation pressure as a function of temperature. Okay, so to, on what basis that changes? Okay, these are the things. Uh, this is dependent upon these quantities, and then. Typically, when we derive such a general expression, what you tend to do is you apply the ideal gas approximation. Okay? Therefore, we can neglect this and we can neglect this. And then we derive the classius clapeyron equation. That's also a useful expression for uh, estimating changes in saturation pressure at different temperatures. Then we derived a series of expressions, especially three expressions for changes in internal energy, changes in enthalpy, and changes in entropy. Again, what is the general pattern for deriving this? We start with an exact differential. We use PDS relationship, and then we use Maxwell's relationship. Okay, so that is the general pattern. These three features are being utilized and then we demonstrated how we can get changes in internal energy in terms of these quantities. In these quantities, everything is, these quantities are all easily measurable. And this depends upon one material quantity, specifically capacity at constant volume. In a very similar manner, using these three features, start with an exact differential relationship, and then use the appropriate TDS relationship, and then a Maxwell relationship and then you get changes in enthalpy. Again, that depends upon one material quantity, the specific capacity and constant pressure, and then these are all fairly easily measurable. Then we, likewise, we looked at changes in entropy. As you can see, heat capacity measurements are very useful and helps in uh, expressing changes in internal energy, enthalpy, and entropy. So, these heat capacities are well documented. So we also found other relationship uh, for uh, heat capacity and measured constant pressure and constant volume. 
Okay, so uh, this kind of difference between heat capacity and constant pressure and constant volume, we derived in the first half of the uh, course for ideal gas. In this later part, in the last example, we did this for uh, in a more general manner because these are important because these are going to be used in obtaining changes in internal energy and enthalpy and network. We also stated some uh, relationship uh, involving heat capacity. So heat capacity at constant volume is always greater than heat capacity at uh, constant. Uh, the heat capacity at constant pressure is always more than CV. Heat capacity measured at constant volume. And the difference between them decreases with decrease in temperature at equal to zero. They always uh, go to zero. And then we also define what is an perfectly incompressible system. Okay, so we define two material quantities, alpha and beta. One is the expansivity, another is the compressibility. Okay, so that's what we did in the last class. So typically, the pattern we use is we derive certain expressions and apply it for the simplest system, which is the ideal gas, and then move to real gases. An important feature of real gases was brought out by Jules Thompson. Here, this Thompson refers to Lord Kelvin. Okay, so the same Kelvin uh, on whose name the Kelvin scale is uh, derived. So I think when he became a Lord, his name changed from Thompson to Kelvin. Lord Kelvin is the same person. So we have already seen what is throttling. Throttling is an isoenthalpic process. So when you throttle across a valve, or it can be a porous plug, what is kept a constant is enthalpy is kept a constant. Even though enthalpy is a constant, other things like temperature and pressure can change. Interestingly, what happens is, as opposed to pressure, when you throttle, the pressure always decreases. In contrast to this, the temperature can decrease or remain a constant or may increase also. Okay, so, so this change in temperature with respect to pressure is defined as the Joule-Thompson coefficient that can be positive or negative. Okay, so this happens only for a non-ideal system, for a real system. It doesn't happen for an um, uh, ideal case. All right, so what you see is that you can qualitatively understand why temperature changes. For example, in a throttling process, when you draw a, a line of constant enthalpy, in throttling, what happens? The pressure decreases. Okay, So you go from this region of high pressure to a region of low pressure. And the isoenthalpic curve is in, in this form. So if you start here, supposing these exist states are till this point where there's a maximum in temperature, the temperature at the exit point will be higher. But above so-called inversion temperature, if the exit point is in this regime, the exit temperature is less than the inlet temperature. Okay, So this appears co uh, counterintuitive, but if you see what is being conserved, which is just enthalpy, uh, which is compressors of two quantities, U plus PV, then this becomes uh, more intuitive. So here what uh, we are using a porous plot through throttle, okay, so or you could have used a valve also, okay. So there is input condition, inlet condition, and these are the exit conditions, okay. So uh, the question we want to ask is for which cases you will see what kind of Joule Thompson coefficient in for which conditions, which kind of gases you will see decrease in temperature. To answer that question, you can plot the isoenthalpic curves at different temperatures. So these are isoenthalpic curves at uh, different temperatures. Uh, what you see is that they have a similar form, but Beyond a particular temperature, you don't really see a maximum. Okay, so the maximum inversion temperature is at this point. Okay, so what this gives you the locus of all the maximum 
inversion temperature. So this is the highest temperature above which you will see no decrease in temperature. Okay? So if you want to actually see a decrease in temperature, you have to operate below the maximum inversion temperature. You have to throttle below the maximum inversion temperature. So where is this throttling being used? Throttling is often used in liquefaction. In fact, the early, um, uh, in early 1900s, I suppose, there was a great race to liquefy even noble gases. Okay? So these are hard to uh, liquefy. So, uh, so a lot of liquefaction can be done using throttling. So if you want to liquefy a particular gas, you should be able to uh, decrease the temperature. So for that to be possible, you have to be operating at temperatures below the inversion temperature. The lower the inversion temperature, it will be harder to liquefy, harder to cool a gas just by throttling. Okay, so that's the utility of throttling and utility of knowing the sign of Joule-Thomson coefficient. So this happens for real system, real gases, right? So what you then see is, if you mathematically analyze throttling, dH is constant. in throttling. Therefore, using the general expression that we obtained for dA, changes in enthalpy, you keep this a constant, then you get the Joule-Thompson coefficient, which is rho t by rho p, you can express it in this manner. So to get the quantitative values of Joule-Thompson coefficient at different enthalpies, so these are different enthalpy curves, what you need is heat capacity at constant pressure, then you need specific volume. These are available in the PVT tables, right? So these are data that has been tabulated. This is also available for you. Uh, so you can get the magnitude of the joule thompson coefficient. Then we move on to enthalpy changes in real gases. So we derived a general expression for enthalpy changes uh, for all systems, this is what we did in the previous lecture. We want to come up with a general procedure for computing this quantity. How do you go about really computing? Okay, so, in thermodynamics, for real, uh, especially for engineering thermodynamics, we utilize a lot of tabulated values of different quantities. And then, if you can present these quantities that ought to be computed in a convenient form, that's also very useful. That's why if you look at your textbook, the appendix runs for close to 100 pages. Okay? So there are lots of useful tables that are uh, for steam tables, for particular refrigerants, and so on, that you should flip through these tables. Okay? This gives you a wealth of uh, data. You may not be using it extensively during this course, but if you go and join an industry, if uh, these are extremely useful. Okay, so this is one of the main difference between a course that is taught as engineering thermodynamics course and um, let's say a course of thermodynamics that's taught in the chemistry department. Okay, so uh, it, uh, the charts are much lesser because the things which we are interested in computing. Okay, uh, for example, again, uh, you go into power cycles and so on. So there are also lots of data required so it's good for you to just get a feel for what is in that appendix, okay? So we will add something more to uh, what is there in the appendix in this lecture. So for example, you are interested in computing the delta H in real gases. So the philosophy which we are going to adopt is how do we deal with non-ideal? In, uh, in the first half of the class, one measure of non-ideality is the compressibility factor, that is Z, right? uh, which we had utilized. Okay, So we had utilized a compressibility factor and then normalized the temperatures and pressure to reduce temperature and reduce pressure. And then much of the data collapsed. right? So gases at similar reduced temperature and reduced pressure tend to behave in a similar manner. Okay? All the non-ideal systems also they behave in a similar manner. That also helped us 
derive certain equation of states for non-ideal systems. Okay, so we are going to use this fact on how much a system differs from the ideal system, and then obtain changes in enthalpy. Okay, so that's the approach we are going to utilize. So we are interested in computing the enthalpy changes from state one to state two. These are real gases. However, what we try to do is that instead of going in this direction, directly trying to compute this, we use an isothermal process to decrease the pressure. Okay, so at low pressure, in fact, at zero pressure, it will always be an ideal gas. Okay, so the real gas will also behave like an ideal gas. So you start at T1, at isothermal, you employ an isothermal change, reach a state of ideal gas, and then increase the, the temperature, and then undergo, undertake a, another isothermal process of increasing the pressure, and then get to reach state two. Okay, so instead of doing going directly like this, we implement this in three stages because all these things are state properties. Okay, so we can afford to do this. Okay, so you will see the advantage in doing this in this manner. Okay, so as I said, that compressibility factor is a measure of non-ideality. Uh, okay, so that is what we are going to use here. So we are going to use this alternate path to define H2 minus H1. So H2 minus H2 star, this star indicates some quantity that is of the ideal gas. Okay, so this is H1 star. This point is H1 star. This is H2 star. Okay, so the star indicates it's a quantity related to ideal gas, that is gas at zero pressure, wherein it will always be ideal. So we just added H2 and H1, added and subtracted to get this quantity. So we have two steps which are isothermal. So this will go to zero in ideal isothermal process. And then there is a process which involving changes in pressure. So we will first implement what is H2 minus H2 star, okay? this point minus this point. Okay? Because it's isothermal process, this is zero. So that is zero here. Then you have this quantity, right? So this quantity is goes from P not equal to zero, that is this point to integrated to P2 of the relevant pressure. Okay? And then you are doing it at temperature equal to T2. Okay, so that's what we are trying to do. Likewise, you can define a quantity H1 minus H1 minus it's corresponding an ideal gas state. Okay, in this case, H1 star minus H1, we can also define that. And then there is a transformation of increasing the temperature as an ideal gas. Okay, this is very easy because uh, the enthalpy changes for an ideal gas is just dependent upon um, temperature, right? So you know the heat capacity. Uh, from that, I can get to the enthalpy changes. Okay, so instead of computing in this path, we have adopted this alternate path and we are undertaking the computation. So, okay, then, okay, so what? How do we go and simplify this? Then we are going to use the compressibility, aspect of compressibility factor. Then if I want to differentiate this, I use V as ZT by P and then differentiate dou V by dou T. And then if you do that simplification, it's a simple algebra, you will get this factor, okay? So H star minus H, okay, whether it's at two, uh, temperature T2 or temperature T1, you can simplify and get this expression. All we did was uh, differentiate this quantity and put it here, and then you will get this quantity, all right? Okay, so this is relevant for this step as well as for this step. Then we substitute T as T reduce times T critical point. Why? Because once we do this, there's an immense collapse of data. 
different real gases behave in a similar manner at the same reduced pressure right so that's what you do you substitute in the previous expressions uh, this data and then i could get what is called enthalpy departure coefficient okay z h is an enthalpy departure coefficient and then i can get from this the previous expression substituting for t and p these quantities i can get this particular form all these things are tabulated in one of the appendix in uh, your textbook or in any engineering textbook engineering thermodynamics textbook so on the y axis you have something called the enthalpy departure uh, what does this mean okay enthalpy departure is the difference between the real gas and the ideal gas okay so this is the property of uh, uh, the real gas okay so here if you see the difference between property of the real gas and the ideal gas is what is being quantified by enthalpy departure how much does a real gas differ from that of an ideal gas at a particular temperature and pressure okay so so i mean uh, because i cut and pasted this graph from your textbook with this all uh, it's not very easily readable but please go and look at uh, these charts in your textbook uh, just to get a feel for what is the data that is being presented and you can also do some problems if you work out problems and some homework problems to get a feel for these charts again what is that we wanted to compute if you remember if we replace the path which we are interested in we broke it down into three different processes okay so this is the alternate path so the enthalpy departure charts are useful for this and this and this we have a simple expression anyway all right so you can rewrite uh, this so uh, just a simple algebra this simple uh, manipulation i'm not going to go into this uh, you can rewrite this in, i mean it's there also the, in the textbook uh, this is a very simple algebra without i'm not going to elaborate any further so this enthalpy departure graph is also useful in other scenarios because enthalpy is connected with internal energy in this manner we can also get differences in internal energy using a similar concept using the uh if i know the enthalpy changes okay um, i can also know the internal energy changes uh, for a particular change between t1 and t2 okay because internal energy and enthalpy are closely related either you need to know this or this once you know one of them you can get the other quantity because uh, internal energy and enthalpy are related in the following manner okay so this gives you quantities uh, enthalpy, uh, enthalpy changes for real gases likewise we can think about so this, this gives you two quantities because we also already mentioned how to compute enthalpy change as well as internal energy change the third quantity which we are interested in is in entropy change so likewise supposing i have entropy change from state 1 that is at t1 p1 to state 2 t1 p2 okay so this is the process i am exploring so again we want to look at uh, in the, as much as possible we want to see how a real gas differs from an ideal gas and use such properties to compute this quantity the difference between entropy 1 and 2 okay in in a similar manner we had utilized for enthalpy changes so how did we in in enthalpy change what did we do we went here and then you went here and then you went here okay so instead of going directly here we adopted an alternate path but when you look at entropy changes we hit a roadblock because if you're wanting to know the entropy change for a gas of pressure zero you have to hit entropy of infinity Okay, so the entropy of gas of uh, at pressure equal to zero is infinity. So you don't want to be integrating along this path. Okay, so what you do is you devise an alternate path. So you first have an isothermal process, the process going from a real gas to an ideal gas. 
then the ideal gas is taken to a state which is which has the same temperature and pressure as that of state one okay so here i have isothermal process then i go from from low pressure to this particular pressure point okay <laughs> pressure and temperature point right? and then i go to state 2 which is again an ideal gas uh, state or or a state 2 where we say that it is also at t2 and p2 okay so that's uh, the claim and then you come back here and then have an isothermal process to come to this point okay so that is the uh, in a way difference between how you treat a enthalpy change as well as uh, treat a entropy change in this case you may have noticed that we have tried to slip something in uh, fast and quick that is this state one star is at high temperature that's fine but we also said it's at a high pressure okay so at high pressures okay or it is at a pressure same as state one okay so this is not necessarily low pressure like this in state 2 also it is in temperature t2 that's fine but it's also at a pressure p2 which need not be low okay the pressure need not be low so these are two imaginary states okay so uh, we are going to be treating them like ideal gas but this is our actually imaginary states we will see what how we deal with this problem okay so again these are two isothermal processes these the terms should be zero and then so what are we doing we instead of going from one to two directly we have utilized the convoluted path right so this state is represented in this manner that is you go from a real gas to an ideal gas and then you go from this state to this state this is an imaginary state but at t1 and p1 with properties like ideal gas we'll see what that really means then you have gone from one star to two star that is this thing this term corresponding to this process and then you have an isothermal process here okay so let us look at the this process of going from at isothermally at a particular temperature you go from this point to another point which is the other point one end state is an ideal gas okay ideal gas okay that is sort of easy because it's isothermal you can neglect this term that's going to be zero and then i'm going to utilize this expression and this is what we are representing okay so you have managed to do that right so all i'm doing is i'm expressing it uh at two to <laughs> implementing this here if you remember we had mentioned that one star is an imaginary state right why did we call it an imaginary state we said that one star is at the same temperature and pressure as that of a real gas so the pressure is high enough it is no longer ideal so where does that particular thing come in the mathematical analysis that's what we we want to be noting here okay so let's go through this again in the sense that we are implementing this formula because it, this is zero into this change right so we are actually going when we want to go from this point to this point that involves going from a real gas to an ideal gas and ideal gas to along this path so this path is represented by this term entropy at pressure p minus entropy of an ideal gas system at pressure p equal to 0 isothermal okay so that is this term this term is 
like an ideal gas okay so you have something like an ideal gas i'll tell what what part of the system is like an ideal gas so you go from pressure p okay equal to 0 to the particular pressure of relevance okay so that is this term so this term and this term for each of this term i am implementing this formula right so here what is different between this term and this point what is different is the specific volume i am using is what is different okay here the i know dv by dt at constant uh, pressure how i am going to be treating the specific volume in these two systems is what is going to make the difference okay so for getting specific volume in this case i am going to use this formula which is applicable for a real gas and for any at any particular pressure um, so this compressibility is incorporated into that formula and then for an ideal gas the compressibility factor is 1 okay so for this formula i am going to compute specific volume of an ideal gas okay for this formula i am going to get the specific volume using a real gas approximation okay so that's what i that's the way i handle this imaginary state okay All right. that's the computational approach okay after that things become straightforward i implement this formula into this uh, this rather straightforward uh, algebra okay so and then uh, the same thing which we did in the uh, previous uh, for enthalpy and so on okay so you use represent this uh, substitute temperature and pressure in terms of reduced temperature and reduced pressure and then all the rest of the steps are uh, similar okay, to what we did for uh, enthalpy you get something like an uh, entropy departure chart okay? this coefficient is called entropy departure coefficient it tells you how much does your real system differs from that of an ideal system okay so that's the entropy uh, temperature uh, coefficient is this quantity and then you can also have uh, a chart which tells you gives you, gives you this coefficient at different reduced pressures and uh, temperatures okay so so this is see we, we where did we see such charts okay if you remember we were interested in tabulating properties okay in the first few lectures of okay, this course the first half of the course we were interested in tabulating properties in case you had an ideal gas okay in, in case you had an equation of state well and good if you didn't have an equation of state the next best thing to do is to have a table of properties okay that's where you first saw the compressibility factor because different systems behave similarly at similar reduced temperature and pressure okay so from that for just there we use compressibility factor for just tabulating simple properties so here we are having similar kind of chart at different reduced pressure and temperature to quantify how much does your system that is the real system differs from an ideal system okay so how much is your enthalpy internal energy and entropy differs from your ideal gas enthalpy internal energy and entropy okay so that's what we have achieved okay so i mean if you uh, work out a couple of problems things will become less abstract so that's what you will do in your homework and so on so in the next series of lectures next few lectures we will look at thermodynamics of chemical reactions